Well, thank you everyone for attending our webinar. I think we heard some really interesting presentations and I saw there were a lot of questions in the chat. So uh, we have our speakers here again today and I really want to thank them uh, one more time uh, for joining and uh, preparing the presentation. And um, in the view of time, I've picked some questions that I think uh, are hopefully interesting for a lot of people. And uh, the first question is actually for you, René. And um, uh, there's a question about different treatments of uh, drugs. Do you suggest to do uh, micro injections of the drug inside the organoids or directly add the treatment to the medium? Uh, what do you think is best? Well, I, um, first of all, I think micro injection inside, inside, well, to the inside of the organoids will be uh, quite labor intensive and not suitable for uh, high throughput screening. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, our experience is that the majority of compounds, especially small molecule compounds, if they're able to permeate uh, to enter the cells, then it doesn't really matter whether you add them basolaterally or apically. So uh, in that case, I would suggest that, well, um, that you should just add them to the medium so that you have a high throughput assay. And only if you have a very specific compound that really is, is unable to enter the cells, see an antibody that needs to be in the apical site. If it's very specific uh, conditions, then you could uh, uh, opt for microinjection. Uh, Ruchi and Dennis, do you have any experience with this? Uh, do you agree with uh, René or uh, do you share a different opinion? Yeah, with organoids, I think the, um, the problem on the diffusion uh, is something that everybody needs to deal with. Uh, that uh, leads to variability in the core and the peripheral uh, cells. But then also they hold a value for magnetic studies uh, and also drug clearances. Um, so that's, uh, and there are, uh, in, the, in terms of cell organization using endothelial cells, there are ways that can in future may help overcome some of the limitations that we see today. I, I would agree totally to Renee. Like all, all the important drugs will be able to to, to go into the cells, that's kind of anything that's kind of clinically important. I think there might be two compounds that would need to inject into organs, but then you really look into individual ones, but not, I don't know, 50 organs so well <laughs> at the same time. Okay, well, thank you all. Uh, I think there's really a valuable insights. Um, maybe I can ha handle one of the questions for Dennis. Uh, there was a question about the passage number. Uh, do you uh, always use passage 5, is that the key point, or uh, is it different per cell type? Well, passage number 5 is just kind of an empirically chosen passage number, and that's just based on when did we see after which passage um, the culture has stabilized, or how likely is it that it would crash afterwards. And this is just why we pick usually passage 5 to determine like a so-called success rate. But it can be different from organoid to organoid or even for different tissues. And this is mostly based on pancreatic cancer. Okay. So, René, are you also having a, a sweet point for the, the passage number or is it uh, different for uh, your organoids? Well, um, it depends what you want to do. But in, in essence, I think with the majority of the organoids, you can, if your culture is successful, you can pass them for quite long and it doesn't. I mean, of course, you shouldn't go to extreme, but it doesn't matter too much exactly which passage number you take. Um, yeah. But yeah, it depends a little bit on the organ type, but which passage number you really see whether your culture is successful or not. But passage five seems to be a really good number. Is that the same for the liver organoids, uh, Ruchi? So I think the number five is something that it's, it's a synchronization of uh, of your process, and even in the primary cells, it's, it's the passage three, passage five, because you have to take the cells through a particular course and culture. So I think it's a, it's a midway because after that, the cells, if they are primary, they start going through the senescence. Um, and yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, there is another question for you, Ruchi. Uh, could organoids speed up or reduce the cost in drug development? And if so, how can they do this? Yeah, by reducing uh, the animal testing is quite an expensive uh, process and method. 
um, so by reducing that. And also there are the aspects of uh, drug metabolism that you can look through um, human cellular models and using organoids you can look into drug clearance as I was telling earlier as well. So putting these into a process in itself uh, is enough to reduce the cost. Not entirely, but uh, in every process, 25-30% of the cost can be reduced. Yeah, and I think at the Hub, uh, you ha also have a lot of experience with personalized medicine uh, for uh, with testing the drugs, right, uh, René? Uh, do, do you see uh, that it can also be a benefit there? Yeah, I think it can definitely be a benefit because it's much more uh, uh, representative to the actual patient and much closer to the actual patient and therefore the uh, any drugs that you develop using the organoids are much, uh, would have much higher success rates um, towards actually being successful in the clinic. I think that's really the majority of, of the costs uh, and pharmaceutical development are all the, the failed uh, drugs, which do have to go through all the processes. So uh, by tweaking that success rate, like you can already be in huge margins there. Yeah, exactly. I see uh, a lot of nodding from Dennis, so I guess he uh, totally agrees with you. Yeah, the reduced system just avoids, in our experience, a lot more of the false positives because when you we did like a side by side comparison of when you put an organoid into a two dimensional space and would just compare it 2D versus 3D and would see less hits in a 3D setting, but these would be then the, considered be the, the true true hits. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I think I have a, a, a more general question to the three of you. Um, is uh, where can we obtain organoids? Uh, is it best to make them ourselves or can we purchase them uh, somewhere? Maybe okay. let me start. Like, as, as I had mentioned in my talk, like we, we're building this biorepository with ATCC and that's like an NIH funded project. And uh, it's just kind of a lot of the big uh, institutes are really joining these efforts to come up with a big biorepository with sequencing data attached, uh, well characterized, and even with clinical uh, data and a six month follow up. So that's kind of maybe the easiest uh, resource at the moment. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, uh, the, the, the HGMI projects in collaboration with the, well, from the HCC was, were actually also participating in that. And it's, uh, I think, one of the main goals of we, uh, why we want to, wanted to participate in that project is because for us, it can be uh, a little bit time consuming to get all of the patient consents uh, or all the consents and the ethics uh, uh, organized before shipping organized. And uh, it's, the, the HCC is formed in such a way that it's much easier to get through past, the, past all these hurdles. So um, that's why we're also collaborating in, in, in addition to our own biobank, uh, delivering samples uh, which are anonymized to the ATCC, so that it's easier for researchers to get access to the organoids. Yeah, and we have all the licenses, so uh, for all our lines and samples, we have HD license, we have informed consent. So we are able to provide them directly, buy it from a website or they can just contact us. Okay, perfect. I see uh, that a lot of questions are still popping up uh, in the chat. I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions mm -hmm. uh, since we're already running a bit out of time. Uh, I would like to ask something to you, you uh, Rob, actually, since uh, we haven't heard from you yet. Um, so, do you have any insight into what growth factors you think that can uh, have a very big impact on uh, organized cultures uh, by having them? Uh... That's a wonderful question, putting me on the spot. Um, <laughs> I think probably the, the growth factors that are really important are you know, we need to be producing those in an animal free way. Um, so, you know, products like our TGF beta one to make um, cell, stem cell culture and organoid culture really animal free. So you can have that translatability. Um, I know that in the industry, Dennis already mentioned our spawned in one and conditioned media to take away those kind of uh, differences in heterogeneity to start to standardize culture media. And I think that the, the 
you know, we have a corresponding one in our portfolio to offer customers. But I think the other big key area is something like Wint 3A, which is a very complex um, signaling story as well. Um, so I think, you know, we, we, we need to address that fundamentally to, to, to help scientists with a, a standardized Wint 3A condition media as well. But I put it back to the experts who, who, who really know this, but more so than me. <laughs> so do you guys agree with Rob or uh, is he just babbling a bit? <laughs> <laughs> no, growth factors have got huge, uh, huge role to play because if there is variability that's coming um, as your process is happening, you will see different uh, differentiations and so many different things happening. So it's important to have consistency in your batches and a good production process, basically. So. Uh, because you perform such assays and tests over a period of time, it's months that uh, that you go on. So it's important to have good consistency. Uh, I think it's also something that really uh, has been developing recently as well as getting good growth factors. Because in the beginning, when we started working with organoids, we had to make everything ourselves. Uh, and basically, uh, if people wanted to work with organoids, it was a huge time and, and, and uh, investment for people to grow, make all of these growth factors themselves and to curate and get all the medium uh, composition right. So I think this this commercial availability of these growth factors really enabling people uh, with smaller labs and smaller dedication to also do, start doing these argument experiments. Yeah, I, I would totally agree. I mean, the harmonization is very important. And on, on the other hand, like we're still working with patient samples, so it's not just like one size fits all, like every yeah. has like different dependencies even so, and that's kind of what you can investigate over time. But having one standard media that just kind of unifies it over a certain population of organs or a certain tissue type is just very important. So uh, one last question, uh, which is uh, one that I uh, personally am pretty interested in is uh, how does the organoid size affect the outcome of your uh, assays? So is it important to always use the similar size uh, to create reproducibility or uh, does the size not matter? I think it really depends on the question you're asking. Um, well, I mean, I can for your answer taking example, it probably does matter. Uh, if you're talking about a dense tumor organoid, then if you take a very large organoid, what you will see is that when you add compounds, then the outer cells will start dying before the inner cells actually die. So there, yes, uh, if you are very large organoids versus very small organoids, you, you can definitely see a difference. Also, the, the total proliferation can also be a bit lower if you have very large organoids for a very large compact organoid. Around yeah, yeah. If you're talking about these, these cystic organoids, which are just more uh, have a more single cell there, then I think the size is a lot less important with those experiments. And I guess for liver, well, yeah, I know for liver it also uh, will influence your results quite strongly as well. The size. Yeah, it is because of uh, diffusion. You know, there's a lot of studies that have, that have come and they've talked about it that there is variability. Mm -hmm. uh, in diffusion. So if you can um, homogenize and make sure that over a period of time and you are, you have a reproducibility in a way that you could control. You cannot have absolute uh, size control, but uh, there should be some threshold that you have to come up with. Yeah, I, I would just totally agree to both of you. I mean, the other, if you have an image, imaging based assay and you just want to see morphological changes, probably size is important to a certain extent, but um, if you look for drug screens, for example, and you want a homogeneous um, seeding density, and that's kind of what you have to achieve with a very homogeneous um, cell solution in the end. Well, uh, thank you everyone for these really elaborate answers, and I think this was a very nice discussion to have all these insights uh, from you uh, experts in uh, organoid cultures. Um, in a view of time, I think we need to wrap it up. I, I see that there are still questions coming. Um, so maybe uh, what we can do is uh, answer these questions uh, later on and uh, we can send the answers to the audience uh, via email. Um, so I think that will be a good solution to address all questions. And uh, from my side, I would really like to thank uh, all of you uh, once more. 
And I think uh, Rob will totally agree with me that this was a very great and successful webinar. So uh, maybe the two of us can give you a round of applause. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. <laughs> totally appreciated for our first webinar together. Yeah, this was really amazing. And uh, we hope to uh, see you soon at uh, more of our webinars. And uh, thank you again for, uh, for speaking here. And uh, I would say have a lovely day, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, guys. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.